ketchup popsicle, does it sound amazing, refreshing, or terribly stupid? That's one of the worst ideas I've ever heard in the history of broadcast journalism. Check and see. Welcome to Promo Upfront number 103. That's right, kids. It's time for episode number 103 of the Promo uh, Upfront podcast. And we just lost Buddy both Rose. listeners. Yeah, both <laughs> listeners just tuned out. Um, but I am, if, if anybody is listening, I am one of your hosts, Bill Petrie, with me as always. Be the master of mac and cheese, the rear admiral of the mm. return to office strategy, the one and only Kirby Hossam. And Kirby, how are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Uh, obviously, last week we uh, recorded while I was on vacation, a family vacation, and that was great. It was the best kind of vacation. And uh, what I mean by that is, A, it was really great to spend time with the gang, and I, we really did do that. But by the end of the week, I was like really excited to come home. And that yeah. always honestly makes me feel good because I'm like, I think so many times people take vacations to escape their life. And to a degree, that's okay. But sure, when I'm like excited to get back to the life that I've created, I'm like, okay, I'm on the right track. And so right. I'm feeling pretty good. How about you, bud? Good, good. I enjoyed your vacation as well. I had a great time. <laughs> um, but it sounds like you spent your time wisely. It sounds like you you really had a good time. And in speaking of that, you know, Kirby, what is, what is the most precious thing we all really do need to protect? It, it is time, isn't it? It is time, yes. It is time. That's right. Time, you know, running a promotional products business, Kirby, it takes a lot of time. It's, it's, it's so challenging to juggle that, right? Especially in the summer when the pool beckons, it's vacation time for you, or maybe you just want to relax a little bit. And that's why every promotional product distributor needs a partner like Evans. That's right. Our good friends at Evans, because they are on a mission to give you your time back. How do they do it? Kirby, I'm glad you silently asked me that question. <laughs> They do it by making working with them easy. That's right. While a lot of companies say that, and they do, making your promotional products distributor life easier uh, is exactly in their DNA at Evans. From processes to inventory to communications, Evans makes your life easy. Isn't that right, Kirby? It totally is right. And I think that that's what, the, you know, what Evans does, what the best suppliers do is they take a uh, an incredibly complicated business and an incredibly complicated process and make it simple. And as we have discussed many times on this podcast, simple is not the same as easy. And so when you can do that, no. uh, it, it, it's really powerful. And it's, it's it, having a partner like that is powerful for your business. As the kids would say, Kirby, one hundo, one hundo. <laughs> uh, that's right. Evans understands that in today's marketplace, it's not enough to create high quality and cost effective decorated merchandise. Just about every supplier does that. Yeah. More than that, Evans really understands the value in making the entire process easy so that busy distributors, much like you, Kirby, can spend your time focusing on other things. To put it bluntly, Evans has your back. And hey, we're not the only people who notice this stuff, guys. The right. entire industry has noticed because they've been nominated for a Supplier Star Award. So if you've had an amazingly easy experience with Evans, vote for them by visiting PPAI, PPAI.org slash Supplier Star before the deadline of Friday, July 8th. And if you haven't worked with Evans and experienced how they can truly make your life easier, visit them at evans-mfg.com. Evans, products for better living. Kirby, all right, we've done our sponsor read. I've sang a little song at the top of the podcast. Amazing. Shall we, you know, as Michael Keaton said in the first Batman film where he was Batman, you want to get nuts? <laughs> Let's get nuts. Okay. All right. So I'm really excited to get your reaction on this. Uh, I don't oh know if boy. you've seen it. Uh, so the Ohio State University <laughs> was awarded a trademark on the word the by the United States Patent and Trademark Office this week. The university received the trademark the on branded products associated with and sold through athletics and collegiate channels. Those products include hats, baseball caps, and t-shirts. So OSU licensed the most used word in the English language 
V. Do you love it, Bill? So Kirby, this is a podcast. I'm going to be wrong about five times. Um, I have another admission later on that we'll talk about. I think it's the stupidest, most genius move I've ever seen. Um, it's dumb in the fact that the government trademark office allows any entity, let alone Ohio State University. That's right. Ohio the State University. I'm Ohio not used to no, Ohio State University. <laughs> That they're allowing the university based in Columbus, Ohio, <laughs> to trademark the word the for apparel, caps, and things like that. But they did. And so you have to commend Ohio State University, the. comma the, uh, <laughs> for having the foresight to push this application forward. Now, they tried to do this before with 2019. The, oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah. With the oh, but I hey, look, I don't like it, but I have to stand back and say, man, somebody smarter than me figured out and trademark that. Look, Pat Riley, the former coach of the Lakers and Miami Heat, um, I don't know, I think he's coaching somewhere now, but I don't watch basketball. He trademarked the word three peat. You cannot win three championships in a row as a as a, a sports organization without lining Pat Riley's pockets. Yeah. So you can no longer produce apparel that has just the word the on it without paying Ohio State University, <laughs> comma the. And I think it's quite brilliant. I hate it, but I love it. So okay, I'm so conflicted, all right. Kirby. All right. So I actually want to give you some credit because I thought this was just a pour a lemon juice in a paper cut topic for me uh, <laughs> just to get at you. Because um, I, again, I'm with you. I thought that it was silly. And then, but then the idea of, trademarking the most yeah. common word in the English language is is not only is it I think fairly brilliant in the sense that it does exactly what you said it does it's it but it it also shows the power of the brand too right absolutely um and so whether you know some of the biggest brands in college football you could name a bunch of them um but the idea that OSU right I mean I, I gotta think gigum is trademarked somehow right well, for, the, for eight, the comparative for... is the comparison is 12th man is trademarked. Okay. So okay, there you go. 12th 12, 12, 12th man has been trademarked by Texas AM. They license uh they license it out for a very low fee to the Seattle Seahawks. Okay, I was for, wondering about that. They can't they can't call the if you ever notice when you listen to a, a Seattle Seahawks broadcast, they don't call them the 12th man, they call them the twelves, but it's close enough that a and actually does license it for something like five grand a year, like a nominal fee. Hmm. But yeah, so, I mean, the university, the shirt I'm wearing right now does something similar. Although I think, I'm sorry, 12th man, there's a whole story behind that, 100 years old. The word the is a freaking word that everybody uses 5,000 times a day. Which is why it's more brilliant. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the real I think the real issue here I think honestly brilliant move by Ohio State congratulations the U.S. Patent Office that's just that's, or the trademark office that's just dumb that is short sighted and stupid that should have been rejected something that's like trademarking Happy Birthday that if I have Happy Birthday on a shirt I got to pay somebody I mean it gets that's silly to me to me there are just certain words that are public domain I'm sorry the word the feels very public domain to me. But yeah. I don't, I don't, dis yeah, I don't disagree, but the idea of the, the point that they you were making the about the, that they, it was a brilliant marketing move. And from Absolutely. a branding perspective, it's super powerful. And what it is, is it's doubling down on the power that you have. I mean, part of yeah. the story is to say, we're so good at this that we can <laughs> trademark right. the most common word. So I thought it was right. It, it, it is, and it is super powerful, but you know what else is super powerful, Kirby? That's using that amp. Marketing service, if you're a distributor, <laughs> that's right. It's already June. It's almost July for crying out loud. There's no time like the present to consistently amplify your sales through stunningly beautiful outbound marketing from our good pals over at Promo Pulse. This is the perfect thing to do if you're not doing any marketing. Head over to promopulse.io slash amp and you can learn how to set your marketing and forget it in only five, five minutes. All right, Kirby. So we talked about, uh, we've talked about return to office strategy. Okay. And I think where you and I have kind of fallen on it in a very general perspective is the hybrid model is a good one. A couple of days in the office, a week, a couple of days not in the office, right? 
Ish. Some, some, something yeah. like ish, depending on your company, depending on what you do. Yep. So very, very interesting uh, article on Fast Company. And I doubt, I don't know if you saw this. I don't no, want to I doubt don't think that so. you've seen I, it. That was yeah. very assumptive of me. But they're saying that the 3-2 model, which is three days in the office, two days out of the office, leaves everyone dissatisfied. Hmm. Okay. Um, Apple's forcing people to do this, Citigroup, Google Amex. So it is kind of the established model for getting back to quote unquote normal. So the three, and two, three, as, three in, th- yeah, two out. three in, two out. Okay. Uh, it's seen as a compromise between managers who want to keep tabs on their workers, right. And, and build company culture and workers who feel more happier and productive at home. Right. So mm-hmm. it's seen as this kind of happy medium. The problem is that it feels like it's the right mix, but it's not okay. 76% of Apple employees are not happy with the three, two plan 76%, which is a pretty big number. Yep. 56. This this was one that shocked me. 56% of Apple employees that were surveyed are looking into other work options because of the in-office requirement. Hmm. Okay. And then even some top executives are resigning. So why is it failing? It takes away from I'm just did from the article and then I want to talk to you about it. Why it's failing. It takes away the worker freedom that everyone's had in the past couple of years. We've had complete autonomy at home, right? And, and I think you get that genie out of the bottle, Kirby. It's tough to put back in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it harms productivity, I think. Um, I think, you know, it, it does harm productivity. There are certain people who are better working alone. And by forcing them to interact in an office, it does make them less productive. And by the same token, there are people who need that daily interaction Mm-hmm. and their productivity is harmed because they're forced to stay at home. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's an easy answer. I just want to get your opinion on it. I really, like I said, stunned that 56% of, of Apple employees are looking for other employment because now they have to go in the office a few days a week, and I don't know if you have any solutions. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, um, I so, do too. So a couple mm-hmm. things. I, I think 56% of Apple employees are looking for uh, another job because they have to go back to the yeah. office. Well, they, they can't go to Tesla. No. Right? No, they can't because, go to Google, Amex, yeah. or uh, Citigroup either. Right? Because uh, I'm literally, I have pulled up a mm-hmm. thing that yeah. was a topic that I've been sitting on is that Elon Musk has said, anyone who wishes to do remote work must be in the office for a minimum, and I mean minimum, of 40 hours per week or depart Tesla. Okay? Yeah. So- it's not just Apple and it's so now right. that being said, the three, two model yeah. being the, just the, I think that's funny that all these people are, are all these innovative. Yeah, I don't know how inno- they settled on it. <laughs> well, all these innovative companies all decided, yeah. well, we're all going to do it the same way. That's interesting to me. Yeah. So yeah, I do think it's a little bit broken and you know, it reminds me of the thing. Mm-hmm. The problem is, I forget who I just saw say this, that said that do unto others as you would have done unto you is bullshit. Mm-hmm. You do unto others as they would have done to themselves, right? Like, so in other words, yeah. like the idea that you are forcing everybody into this hybrid solution, I think is broken. Mm-hmm. I, th- like, I think the, I, I've said many times, I love the ability to work from home. I don't want to. I don't want to be forced to. And so and you're I, pissing everybody me... off by doing it the opposite, like saying everybody has to do right. both. Like there are people who are introverts and would, would do like one of my best friends from high school has been working from home long before it was cool. He's worked from home it's for just... 20 years. Forcing him to go back to the office would be stupid. He's proven over yeah. time that he'd be great at it. And so I, to, to me, it's about going and and I think that the, the the opportunity people have moving forward is, or organizations have moving forward, is to yeah. clearly define mm-hmm. the role of the specific position that they are hiring. Because there are positions yeah. that it does that be matter yeah. that they have to be in thing. And as long as people yeah. know that coming into it, I think it's fine. The challenge is you're trying to, again, you're you're kissing your sister on this one where you're right. like, okay, I'm going to do this. Uh, you know, you have to do both. And so that's the part that I think is broken is you give people the opportunity both. And as long as they're getting things done, if they, I, I just think it's funny to me that, that part of the solution is no, you can't come in on Thursday. Yeah. No, you can't come in yeah. on Friday because it, you've already been here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That, it's just weird yeah. to me. Yeah, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again here. I loved working from home until I was forced to do it. Yep. And I've learned how to do it. I've learned how to do it well. 
early in my career, I did work from home and I was terrible at it, mm-hmm. right? There was Hogan's Heroes on in the background and I was doing that. <laughs> I'm not that way anymore. I had to teach myself how to be effective and efficient at home. I am more efficient working here than I would be in a traditional office environment. And I, and I think some of the solutions are kind of what you're saying. You got to experiment with a little bit and know what your organization is. Mm-hmm. Saying people have to be in X amount of time per week doesn't make sense. Give them the flexibility of, look, there are times when you need in-person meetings, right? If you're doing something creative and people are close enough where they can congregate, that will make that meeting better by being in person. Getting to know someone over lunch in person versus a Zoom, far more effective, okay? You can still do it. It's more, but if you're just having a meeting to tell everybody about a decision you've made, yeah, people don't need to go in the office for that, okay? (laughs) You can just tell them. (laughs) Right. And, right. and here's where I think a lot of people get tripped up. And this is the second thing I'll admit I was wrong with in this podcast. Okay. People have this weird concept. And again, I'm speaking from experience here that the culture is in the building. Mm. And that if we want to create a company culture, we got to have people here on the regular, whatever that means, whether it's three, two, two times a month, whatever that is, we need people here because that's where the culture is. I fell into that trap at Promo Corner. I was adamant, we're going to have a physical office space. When when we hired Brandon Petrich, we moved, I, I made him move from Austin to Nashville. Um, and, and not that it was a disaster, it wasn't, but the culture was with the people. And because we're in a digital environment and that does level the playing field in terms of communication. Culture really does lie within the, within communication and the people it's not in a physical building. And I think we get hung up on that. I certainly did. I have seen the light Kirby. I've seen the light, (laughs) but there was a time where I really bought into that. And I still think there are a lot of old school managers that feel like we have to have people here. It's got to feel busy. It's got to feel like there's got to be an energy and there's certain things to that to the creativity, but it doesn't have to always be that way. So I think you have to ask why you're moving people in person before you just say, we got to have people back. Cause sometimes I wonder if this is driven by some arduous lease that somebody has over a building <laughs> that we got to fill this sucker. And I don't know any other way to do it. I don't want to piss anybody. You, when you try to not piss anybody off, you end up pissing off everybody. Yeah. I think that's so, a great point. I was actually listening to a podcast this morning uh, on my morning run where the person was talking about how rarely we as individuals take the time to really check in with ourself and say, yeah. is this really what I want? <clears throat> right. Yep. And I, I, I was like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Cause I'm like, I don't know that I do that. Right. Like very I rarely know. now. I think the same thing is true with an organization. We have to check in and go, okay, is this what we really want? Is this really pushing us toward our goal and not tied to some reason that we did this in the past? And everybody knows you're not supposed to do things because you've always done them that way. Yeah. But most organizations still fall into doing things because they've always done them that way. So it's- Absolutely. It's uh, It's human nature. Yeah. So I think this is one of those moments where um, to the employee's, uh, point. Yeah. We have an opportunity to recreate what we we yeah. know. You know the organization has been. Um, so it's mm-hmm. it, it is a tough spot, but I I do come yeah. back to the idea of saying, give people the opportunity to work in the way that they are most effective. Yeah. And if they're not effective, fire them. <laughs> Absolutely no. You you measure results not on time. Yeah. I think the other thing is you can experiment with how you want to do this and be willing to if it's not going well, scrap it. Yeah. Use um you know what I write down. Use experimentation as an opportunity to learn. Period. That's it. Hey, we're going to try this for a month or two and see if we like it. If not, we're going to scrap it. And that's okay as an organization to say we're trying something because we're all in uncharted territory here. The right. genie's out of the bottle. We all like working from home. Now, a lot of us do. Right. I was going to say, we don't. So, all. Interesting. Stuff. That's the challenge. No, yeah. no, I'm, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. All right. So I thought it was interesting. So, okay, let's see if we can find another topic I was wrong with today. Kirby. <laughs> okay. So this is just a silly one, but I thought it was funny. Uh, the title of it is Biff Returns to Sell VHS of the Future. Um, so 37 years from Biff from Back to the Future finally got his revenge. Tom Wilson, the actor who played Marty McFly's bully in the classic film trilogy, recently auctioned off a near mint VHS copy of Back to the Future. The winning bid 
$75,000. Okay. A, I thought this was very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. B, to me, this is one of those things when people say, what is the value of an NFT? Mm -hmm. What the hell is a value of a collectible VHS tape? To me, those things have run in parallel. And so mm -hmm. now, again, I'm not like king of the NFTs and I'm still trying to understand all that, but it's like the idea of saying, well, it's just not worth anything. Well, neither is a stamp. And so to me, when you are selling a VHS tape for $75,000, hilarious to me, by the way, that Biff did it. Yeah. Um, and so mm -hmm. that was sort of the tie-in I had. Wanted to see your take. Value is decided by the purchaser, right? We decide yeah. what is value, what the value of anything is. We accept it or we reject it. My biggest question is how does anyone have a VHS or VCR <laughs> to know if that's even back to the future in there and not some like, you know, old copy of the Morton Downey Jr. show from a late night? I, I don't know. Um, I think it's interesting that someone would spend $75,000 on something like that. Um, I, I assume it's autographed by by Biff Tannen. Yeah, so um, just auctions not. of mm -hmm. iconic 80s movies have been scoring big lately. Uh, Goonies sell, sold for 50 grand. Yeah. Jaws, 32.5, and Ghostbusters scaring up 24. All right, well, first of all, <laughs> the fact that Jaws didn't outsell the Goonies hurts my heart in <laughs> so many ways. But here's the thing, nostalgia sells, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Goonies nostalgia never die. always has never seen the movie meg herber <laughs> gets very upset with me i've never seen the goonies i've tried it a couple times and it just i, I get about 10 minutes and i'm bailouts i could list a whole bunch of things like that like the godfather i never i've tried to sit through the godfather it's a terrible movie but that's not what we're talking about today we're talking about a good movie in back to the future and we're talking about uh some biff tannen uh, selling uh, uh, the tape for $75,000. I don't know. Again, if somebody wants that, great. Good for Biff. Good for the person who bought it. They must feel like that's worth it. Uh, to me, no, not worth it at all. I don't see the appeal. Yeah. Um, to me, it's not, uh, uh, I, I think to me, and I love Back to the Future movies, a signed post movie poster by the cast, that would be much more valuable to me than a VHS tape that I can't even play. Okay, all right. That's it. Okay. <laughs> what else you got? All right. All right, Kirby. Um, I don't know if you saw this. Okay. Do you like macaroni and cheese, Kirby? I, I do. I do know where this is going. Okay, cool. Okay. I think you I can't have it anymore. <laughs> now it's called mac and cheese. Yes. So uh, Kraft is rebranding their macaroni and cheese. It's going to be called mac and cheese. Yep. It's meant to reflect the way fans organically talk about the brand and the name. It, so their new slogan is the name changes, the love stays. Basically, it's a subtle box makeover, including a refreshed logo, topography, a single hue blue that amplifies the brand's most recognizable asset, the noodle smile. And they want to... <laughs> Love it. They believe that's going to help brand it as comfort food. I wanted to get your take on this type of a rebranding for a consumer product. Good, bad, who cares? Uh, no, I thought I actually thought it was good. Um, and I think it is a, and again, not like earth, you know, shattering or what, whatever, but when they- the Kirby, it's summer. We don't got a lot to talk about. Yeah. So let's well, just no, kind of no, milk this one. I don't mean it in a bad way. I just mean it was one of those rebrandings that I went, Oh yeah, that makes sense because it's what everybody calls it. To me, it is an organization listening to uh, your customers and saying, Hey, yeah, that's what everybody calls it. So that's what we're going to call it. And we're going to embrace that. And so to me, it was a, and then the, the smile, the noodle smile, I thought was great. Yeah. So yeah, I actually, this was one that I went, Hmm, I like it. Uh, you've said everything I was going to say. I think it's brilliant. You listen to your audience. They tell you who you are. Your audience tells you who you are. And over time, macaroni and cheese has become mac and cheese. And yeah. I think it's brilliant. I think it's smart. It's not just wholesale change. The box looks the same. Yep. I, I think it's great. Do you have anything else? Or yeah, one, we just... one quick one, because oh. Danny Rosen sent oh, yeah. it to us. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. And that I just want to, and by the way, that just, if you've made it this far in the podcast, I will say, if you send us topics, we really do try to talk about we them. Do. Yeah, um, so uh, Danny sent us this, that French's uh, yes. brand uh, has created a popsicle out of ketchup, the refreshingly savory and sweet ketchup popsicle made from 100% Canadian tomatoes. So 
I, it's funny. I actually brought this up to my daughter and my wife last night. I was like, what do you think about this? And Jade, mm-hmm. my daughter's like, where the hell do you hear about stuff like this? I'm like, well, we talk about weird stuff. So people bring us up weird stuff for us. Right. So really quickly, ketchup popsicle. Does it sound amazing, refreshing, or terribly stupid? That's one of the worst ideas I've ever heard in the history of broadcast journalism, period. Um, I think it's terrible. I, I don't know. It's, I don't know. No, I think it's terrible. I first of all, French is here. Here's what how you know it's Canadian. In in our in, in the United Snakes down here, French is is mustard, right? Okay. In Canada, French is is very big with the ketchup. Okay, they're okay. big with the ketchup and the mustard. So it didn't surprise me when you said they were Canadian tomatoes, and who knew that Canada was famous for tomatoes? But I digress because I love all of our friends in, uh, in the Great White North. I don't need, if I'm hot, I don't need a savory popsicle to cool me down. That sounds really gross. It's like, um, yeah, hey, I got an idea. I'm going to take some mayonnaise, freeze into ice cubes and make a mayonnaise old fashioned. Does that sound good to you? Everything about this sounds gross. So I, I'm with yeah, you. We don't, have to, terrible. <laughs> we don't have to spend a lot of time. I just wanted to let the the, the three listeners know that, uh, that there are frozen uh, ketchup popsicles out there. And so for me, it's something for me to avoid. I think it sounds terrible. I think so too. And I just don't know why people have to make it so difficult to try to get something refreshing on a hot day. But I'll tell you who doesn't make things difficult. That's our good pals over at Evans Manufacturing. That's right. Their entire DNA, they, every process, every procedure, everything that they do is designed to remove friction from the process and make your life easier. They got your back. They want you to get on with your day. They want to give you your time back. And there's no better gift than someone having the presence of mind to say, I want to make this easy for you so you can get back to doing what's more important to you. And I love that about our friends at Evans. I'm not the only one. They've been nominated for a Supplier Star Award. That's right. So uh, if you'd like to vote for them, and we highly encourage you to do, head over to ppai.org slash supplier star. Before the deadline of July 8th, give them a vote. Give, give them a little love. Give them back what they've given you. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Evans Manufacturing, head over to evans-mfg.com. Kirby? Hot bloody chicken sea. Goodbye to episode 103.